Hello? Can, is this working? Hi. Good morning. It's so nice to be here. Um, I'm so excited, actually, to share some of my experiences. Um, and this is new for me. When uh, Mark and Ryan uh, came to meet with me, um, I said, you know, I don't usually do speaking engagements. Um, I'm used to the stage, but not to speak, only to dance. So today I thought this theme of depth, um, it's quite profound. And I wanted to reach a little deeper into my thought process about how I came to be who I am and how I got here and and what does that all you know summarize um, it's tough um, I'd really like think about what would be interesting to share um, so here I go here's a photo of me of course and I wanted to start by saying that you look at this photo and I like it and I want to say that I didn't always look like that. Um, I came to Canada at age eight um, with my mother. My father had gotten to Vancouver just a few months before and um, was living with his sister, my aunt. They were our only relatives here in Vancouver. My mother and I came and um, we didn't speak a word of English. I, the, pretty much three days after arriving, um, was taken to an elementary school and kind of immersed in a world that I knew nothing about. So talk about culture shock. I was the only Chinese girl in my class. Um, we were told to pack a lunch, so my mom packed some leftovers from the night before, and I opened up my lunch, and it was so different from everyone else. So that's how I started, and um, it was 1977. So then Vancouver was very different. Um, as a, a, an eight-year-old, um, it wasn't a very friendly place when you didn't fit in, and uh, you were so different, and you know, even my clothing, everything, and plus I couldn't communicate. So what I'm trying to, I think, convey now is that I reached to things that I knew, and dance was always a part of my environment. So my parents were both principal dancers with the National Ballet of China. I'd always had artists, musicians, um, uh, of course, dancers, choreographers um, around visiting. And I was always at the studio as well. And I watched this amazing art form at the theater, watched these beautiful performances and um, loved it, wanted to be a part of it. And in Canada, my parents had to make a living. What did they do? What did they know how to do? They knew ballet. They knew great ballet. And they knew how to teach it. So they started to teach, but it was very different to the National Ballet of China. They started and they rented a basement, apart, uh, basement studio, I remember, um, where the ceilings were low and you know, it, it, it also dubbed as a ballroom studio by day. And um, so that was how I started my career. I started to train, and um, it wasn't, as, as you will know, it wasn't an easy road. Um, so there were lots of struggles. Um, but. Along the way, I think, what I discovered was that I needed, I need to advocate for myself. Um, I need to uh, really be good, really be the best at what I was doing so that I wouldn't be bullied at school, so that I wouldn't be called names, so that I wouldn't be looked down. And I built this strong sense of resilience, which is 
what I'm trying to also pass on to the students that I work with now, but this sense of survival. It was survival, you know, um, because if you're not good at anything, nobody wants to be around you. No, and that, you know, and, and that was my thought process. So I thought, at that point in time, I've got to be really good at something. So I, I pushed really hard and I wanted to dance well. So my depth, as I look at everything that I've accomplished to date, all the milestones, all the glories, the great moments of my career, um, I believe that I was truly motivated and driven by love. Love is such a powerful strength that, that you know, and I don't think a person can be a great dancer without the love of this art form. There's art, you wake up with pain each and every day of your life because you've been practicing so hard. And you go back into that studio to get more criticism so that you can get better. You go on that stage to be reviewed by critics who may or may not like your performance. And when they don't, everybody knows. And is it true that you're only as good as your last performance? No, because in the end, I've learned, and many of us do, that we do it for ourselves. But this drive and this motivation, it comes from such deep love. And this, this, this heart, this has been the thread of all the, all the milestones in my life. So I'd like to just get a little bit into my desire, my depth of desire, <laughs> to be a ballerina. Um, after learning English and after doing all the hard work and training, I joined the National Ballet at age 19, and I was the youngest member of their corps de ballet, which is the starting rank, it's the group. But I knew, I knew that I wanted to be the prima ballerina, I wanted to lead the company, I wanted to be the girl in the center, not the girl on the side. And I had that drive, I had that motivation, so what did it take? I practiced four times as hard, 20 times as hard, put in the time. I was, in 1988, the only Chinese girl in the National Ballet of Canada. Um, I had nobody to, as I was saying in that short little clip, I didn't see anybody on stage like me in that company. But, you know, that didn't matter to me. I, I had sort of blinders on. I had my goals. I wanted to be the best dancer that I could be. In. And um, so there were lots of battles. And so some of these battles are very personal. You know, there are certain aesthetics to be a dancer. Um, you know, and uh, it's very judgmental. Everybody around you is very judgmental. Don't get me wrong, I still love it. <laughs> but it's true, and sometimes that makes you better. You're very conscious, very, very conscious. So when I was um, in my later mid-teens, training hard, I, uh, you know, I haven't told many people this, but I, I battled with anorexia. I, um, you know, maybe it's common in our industry, maybe not, but you know, people say when you have an eating disorder, it, it, you want to control something, have some control over what you're doing, and that, that was a setback for me. Why? Because now that I became a professional, I didn't have the stamina. I realized that I d knew nothing about nutrition. Anyways, all of this to say that there were... Oh, I did need to mention, you know, there was a lot of emotional and verbal abuse as well. But we, I took it, we took it, and we would never want to put anybody through that now because we as human beings have evolved and, 
you don't get better by putting someone down. But again, I survived. And it did make me better because I wasn't going to quit because of it. And so the depth of my love for this art form um, left me feeling privileged to be there, privileged to dance on that gorgeous stage and to be able to tour around the world. So this was also of the same photo shoot. Um, was taken close to the time when I celebrated the 10th year of being a principal dancer with the National Ballet. I was their principal dancer for 15 years. And I felt the privilege of being able to live many incredible lives on stage, um, from being ethereal creatures to princesses, to peasants, to swans and fairies. That was the addiction, if you will, the, the, the euphoria of being on stage and to be able to do all of that. Um, and I lived it and I loved it and it was so fulfilling. I traveled the world and danced at some of the best, biggest opera houses and worked with some of the most inspiring partners and choreographers. So yes, it was a difficult passage and I think I'll come back to this later because now I'm taking people, young people through this passage and I want to be able to not repeat any of those mistakes or turbulences that I felt. But at the end of the 15-year principal dancer career with the National Ballet, I retired at age 40. And um, I was already a young mom. Um, Mark mentioned earlier that I'm a hopeless romantic that maybe carried into my stage life as well. I believed in those love stories. Um, but I'm very fortunate to have a husband who has always supported me. Um, so I know the importance of finding a support system. Um, people who love you unconditionally, and it's not easy. And, and it's not easy for them <laughs> because I remember once I was uh, rehearsing Shakespeare's uh, Taming of the Shrew. And um, it's a character that I, I didn't know how to portray. Katerina, you know, I'd go into the studio and part of the choreography had me spitting at other dancers because of her anger. And every time I'd look into those huge mirrors that were wall on, on the wall, you know, floor to ceiling, I'd see a, a tiny Asian girl who was trying to beat everybody up, you know? And, um, but I needed to prove to myself that I could transform and do that role. And so <laughs> I didn't know this, but after we'd done that performance season of Taming of the Shrew, my husband goes, I'm so glad you don't have to rehearse for that role anymore. You were really, really snappy all the time, <laughs> you know? And I didn't know that. But, you know, so I'm this, this amazing love of my life. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary on Monday, and I'm really proud of that. Um, and uh, it's all him. He, he's the... He's the the, the generous one and the, the supportive one, and I try um, my best. Um, and it's rubbed off on me, I think, again, back to this love and compassion, empathy. Um, I'll flip to my next photo, which is one of my very favorites. This was my curtain call when I did my farewell performance at the National Ballet of Canada. And my son, Avery, came on stage with his dad and his grandparents. And um, he saw all these balloons fall down. And there were 
people from the audience throwing flowers up on the, to the stage, and he was just bewildered. Um, and his grandfather whispered to him, goes, go pick up one of the bouquets for your mom. Go and pick up one of those bouquets, you know? So he goes almost to the edge of the stage, and I was like, please don't fall off. <laughs> And I'm, you know, we're performing here. It's a live audience and the corps de ballet and all of my colleagues are behind me. And he's going to go forward to pick up a bouquet. And the audience, he has the audience like smitten. And um, he tries to pick up this bunch of roses. It was bright pink and it was too heavy for him. <laughs> and so I have to go next to him and help him with it and we try to pick it up together and of course I have that amazing memory always with me and um, you know he uh, he's such a bright bright light in my life because as I told you when I came to Canada at age eight um, I was unfamiliar but I'm li I lived a childhood through my son again. And I discovered all these things and I discovered the changes, the wonderful changes. And I discovered through his eyes, the innocence of not to prejudge, not to ha anticipate certain outcomes uh, from preconditioning. And, that was such a growing part um, of who I am now. Um, is there another picture? Let's see. That one. So, um, yes. Now, yeah, now he's 16 and a, and a full-fledged teenager at six feet tall. <laughs> Through Avery and through being a mom, I found the depth of selfless love. So prior to becoming a mother, um, I do want to say, and this is potentially a bit of an exaggeration, but not really, it was all about me. It was all about what I needed to do, what I needed to do to do what I need to do on stage, what I want, what's good for me, what what everybody else was support and and I see that now um, when I was a dancer I was not I was not egocentric I was not mean that's not part of who I am but I needed to have those things for me so that I can do my best work and my life prioritized around my dance but after giving birth to Avery it was um, so liberating I want to say it was liberating to not have it all about me and to have someone that I loved so much to, to want to be so selfless. Um, so I said that at, at, at that moment in time, I, I was 40 and um, it was my retirement performance. But the big question is, um, who is Chan Hon Go? if she's not a dancer. Who, who, up until 40 years, I mean, dance was all I did. And not to say that I didn't love and enjoy other things. I think if there's something that I, I'm proud to share is that um, it wasn't, after, you know, that determination to become the best I could be, to become the principal dancer, um, I discovered other things, um, you know, again, coming from immigrants, you know, the fi financial aspect of making a living is a constant. And so um, what else do I do? What else, how else can I improve myself? So what you see on this table is another project that I did while I was dancing and it's still going on. So you see some point shoes. Point shoes, as I say to new parents, is what differentiates ballet from other forms of dance. 
no other form of dance will have ladies going up on point. Sometimes the gentlemen do as well, but it's not, um, it's not common. Um, so the ladies all the time in classical ballet are in point shoes. And my husband and I, after um, being married 10 years and I was already well established, um, I sustained a foot injury horrible stress fracture in my metatarsal, and I couldn't dance. And I thought, oh my gosh, like when dancers get injured, it is like the end of the world. So like you feel like the world is moving ahead and you're still, or you're going backwards. And, and when it's your foot, you can't even walk. So I was doing a lot of swimming, a lot of Pilates, but then I thought, why am I getting injured? And then it happened again a year later. So in my career, three stress fractures, and out of those three stress fractures came this beautiful product of principal shoes. I, um, I was thinking, you know, why am I getting injured? And I'm like, is it my technique? I was thinking, there must be something that I need to support my foot better. Now these shoes have been around for like, hundreds of years, and the, and the way they're made hasn't really changed. They're still hand-stitched. It's leather on the bottom, and um, no, it's not wood or any metal or anything on the tip. It's just layers of canvas and burlap and glue. So they, they will melt after use, and they get soft, and then, you know, this leather will also break down, and then what is there to support the feet? So. I ventured out and we designed our own point shoes. We, we consulted with all these fantastic sports medicine doctors that I had as a principal dancer um, connections with to st and, and consulted with them and asked them, where, where should we be supporting the feet um, when the ballerina is on point? And you know, it's like, it, it seems so obvious now, but nobody has done that. And so we did that and we came out with a product. And um, so then that was very entrepreneurial. And anyways, I don't know, how am I doing for time? I don't want to, okay, because I got like more to say about the rest of my life. <laughs> um, anyways, so who is Chan Hon Go if she's not a dancer? That's the big question and you know, I would. I had some options to continue on with the company as a, as a rehearsal mistress, as a teacher, but no. I I, I want. I knew there that the rest of my life to live and to to get to know what's out there and what else am I good at? What else am I good at? So, I. Um, decided to come back to Vancouver. You know, I'm an only child, and um, I wanted my son to have family around him. So I decided after retirement to move back to Vancouver. And my parents, after uh, 1977, founded the Go Ballet Academy. Um, uh, a few years after the basement studio, they found a building on Main Street, where we are now. Um, it was a dream for my father, because he would drive by this heritage building, and um, he had received some of his training in London at the Royal Ballet School before going to China. He's Singaporean. Um, and um, he goes, that looks like a place for a classical ballet school. And so that building is, you know, my parents' blood, sweat, and tears, everything went into paying for that building and renovating it um, so that it could be a classical academy. So here I am, age 40, with my son and my husband. We moved back to Vancouver, and my parents, you know, naturally posed the question, do you want to take over the school? But, you know, my mom, she, she'd been administrator at the school for that at that point in time, almost 30 years. And um, she goes, you know, I don't want you to feel like you have to take it over. You know, you, you, you think it over, you, you do what you feel best. 
but you just, you would be really good at it. And um, I don't know, I, and you know, I hadn't taught very much up until then. I, um, I was taking the classes, but I wasn't teaching the classes. And, and um, again, you know, I'm always reminding, you know, being reminded that, you know, still, I just retired from the stage and it was still all about me. And now it can't be all about me anymore and it has to be all about them all about the students, all about the, the production. Nothing was about me. And, and the only thing about me was that my work, the quality of my work, would only show through others. And that's really, really different for me. Because I wanted, you know, I could just practice more and be better. But how could I get them better? So that's that's a very different thing. So, I think this is the perfect segue. Now, with this next picture, if you would indulge me and get up and do what we call a port bra with me. <laughs> All right, just slightly spread out, right? So a port bra now that I'm a teacher, I will show you the basic arm movements in ballet. So that the next time you come to a performance, you'll recognize, because none of the positions stray from these five classical positions, only five. And we can do variations on the five, but they're only five. And it's fantastic, and I encourage you to do it in your office, in your living room, because it actually is wonderful carriage for your back, too. All right, so I'm gonna show you. Okay, so we can stand just hip width apart, right? I'm not gonna stand, we're not gonna work on the feet today, just the arms. <laughs> All right, so this is a first position, and you want to be like hugging a beach ball in front of you. Yes, make it really round, and I want you to tuck your thumb in, and try to sense the middle finger and the thumb. There's a connectivity there. That's right, all of a sudden you're holding yourself. This is out there. This is in, you're, you're compact and you're into your core. This is our first position. And then we open our arms into the second position and it looks like this. And that's what I'm doing with the students. And in this, I want you to make sure your shoulders are down. Drop your shoulders, and you want to have your rib cage in. Don't let it pop out. Right, so now all of a sudden I see you standing taller. Great. And then we go into a third position, which means you just come back with one of your arms. Yeah, and have it away from you, and yes. You want to have long arms and keep, yes, and long neck. Excellent. And then we go into a fourth position, and that side arm's gonna come up. I'm sure you recognize this one. And then for the classic, the fifth position, but don't go around mocking any ballerinas with this position. That's right, I won't make you twirl. <laughs> Keep your shoulders down, Mark. That's right. <laughs> Great, and keep, keep the connection between your thumb and your middle finger right. That's really good. And then we'll just round and back to preparatory position, both arms. Great, now you get your stretch for the day. Sit down, thank you. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm now finding myself now, coming back to Vancouver, um, you know, having to teach and having to pass on my experiences to young dancers. And I haven't done that before and I'm finding my way. But one thing that was um, so apparent to me is, you know, with, a, with my son, who was three and a half, you know, if I was to entrust him with a teacher, you know, what would I want that teacher to impart? And, you know, again, I'm seeing the world through his lens as well, and as a parent now. And I, I'm so grateful, because for me, I'm not sure that I could do my job 
and definitely not do my job as well if I didn't have that, um, that, I, that personal experience that I was going through at that point in time. So uh, the depth of responsibility as a mentor and as a leader now, you know, my first project, I said, okay, let's pause on um, if I want to take over the school or not, but let's, let me produce a show. So my first show to produce was The Nutcracker. I came back to Vancouver in July. That performance earlier um, was in uh, May. I came back to uh, Vancouver in July had summer to kind of plan. And in September, we held our Nutcracker audition. I wanted it to be inclusive of the entire dance community in Vancouver. And my parents really gave me th that support. You know, they believed in that. It wasn't about just giving this Nutcracker to go ballet dancers. Let's open it up to the entire community. Um, we, we wanted live music. We believe in really presenting something world class. And up until 2009, Vancouver did not have its own nutcracker to share and to present every year. We only had the touring productions. And growing up as a, as a young dancer here, it was different productions of the nutcracker. But having danced it, um, for the 21 years I was with the National, um, it's something that we want generations to grow up with. We wanted to set this tradition. And um, I chose the Nutcracker to produce because when I was 19 and in the corps de ballet, I got my first chance to do a principal part. And it was huge. I, to this day, think that maybe it was my lucky break, how they discovered what I can do, the depth of what I can do. Um, Celia Franca, the founder of the National Ballet of Canada, came and um, she chose me to be the Sugar Plum Fairy in her production of The Nutcracker. And I was 19 and was in the corps de ballet and I was paired with a principal dancer. And everybody was like looking at me like, how on earth? Would she be picked? I was, you know, sixth cast because, you know, but still. And that year made my debut as the Sugar Plum Fairy. So I thought, oh my gosh, it, is it, it, I don't know what's happening in the universe, but, you know, the, the, the ballet to produce would be the Nutcracker. And um, anyways, so that's my tie-in to my first project in Vancouver. And... Um, I started to audition, I started to work with these young dancers, and it became so apparent to me that um, the responsibility of teaching these young dancers goes way beyond the steps of what I'm teaching them in the studio. Um, it's all-encompassing, and their life skills, really. And that's sort of my start to where I am now of, um, you know, teaching, um, dancers every day and um, and then being a leader. I eventually took over the school. Did I forget to tell you that? <laughs> I took over the school a year after and oh my gosh, it's hard to lead because nobody tells a leader you're doing a good job. And I was used to always, you know, people saying, you're great, you're wonderful. And <laughs> and I, I had to tell other people, you're great, you're wonderful. Um, so, but Again, my support system, and um, but I, you know, because I'm self-driven, the quality of the work was my great and my wonderful, and um, so I learned a lot. I didn't know too much about business. Had to, you know, obviously make sure that we didn't, you know, go under, and um, I learned about still learning. So constantly still learning. Um, this is the picture of my family. They're my support system. And I chose this picture because, you know, um, I did not, we're, we're standing here at, at SFU. I, as you know by now, started my performance career at age 19. I did not go to university. 
But I remember a conversation when we were immigrants and I was just overhearing my parents and um, they were counting up the pennies and they were like, oh, we're going to make sure that we have enough for Chan to go to university when, when she graduates, right? They didn't know I was so set on being a dancer. A um, couple of years ago, I was nominated and UBC gave me a honorary doctorate. And um, I, I, I was so moved because higher education is still something that I respect so very much. And um, to know that through dance, I had achieved some level of, of distinction was, um, was a huge recognition for me. So um, it, was, it was great for my parents too, because now they can say, <laughs> I have a degree. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I know Mark wants me to wrap up, but it's been so much fun talking to you, and I want to leave us with this slide, because now I find so much of my joy giving what I know to the dancers that I work with. Um, it's so rewarding. Yes, I, I'm you know, confronted with lots of challenges in the past couple of years. Oh my gosh, how do you dance on Zoom? <laughs> but um, but um, I'm just here to say that um, for me, it's the depth of constantly learning is very attractive and it's very energizing and it's my creativity and there's never boredom and um, again I feel privileged um, to be where I am and I want to thank you for listening to my story and and thank you to um, to Mark and um, to my friend Ryan who couldn't make it today but uh, had recommended me today so thank you so much for having me. Hi, it's Philip Chen. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, two, two parter, you know, two uh, thing. Um, during your prime for dancing and teaching, which did you like more? And second part, why did you expand to Toronto? Wow, those are great questions. Um, which did I like more? You know, your question reminds me when reporters ask me which is your favorite role. Because all the roles have different elements that make me love them. So the different, this huge difference be, between being a, a principal dancer and being like the director or teacher, right? Um, which do I like more? If I could have eternal youth and never be sore, I'd love to be that dancer forever. Um, nothing quite equates to that feeling on stage. But you practice for hundreds of hours only for that one performance, you know? And um, to do it and to discover. And, and then the night after, you might do that same ballet again. And you do it somehow just a little differently because you're 24 hours later and you're different, you know? And so those, that kind of allure, um, the dancer will win. You know, um, and uh, about opening my school in Toronto, um, when I left Toronto right after um, leaving the National Ballet, so many people had asked if I would um, uh, teach in Toronto, and um, I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And now um, Toronto was opened in 2019, so exactly 10 years after I'd left, and I had that ter terrific opportunity to start something on my own. I'd taken over the school from my parents here, but to start something in Toronto in a city that I'd lived in for over 20 years, to see the differences, to see what we could bring to Toronto's um, community, because I believe there's not no one in the industry that offers what we offer on this scale and on this level, and I, I needed to test that to prove something to myself, but also really to, to impart what we knew and what I had learned to the community there. Yeah, great questions. Yeah, you've had your hand up the whole time, so don't worry. Shiraz. 
Thank you very much. Thank Hi. you. Good to see you again. Hello. My question is about being mentally fit for dancing as well as physical fit, fitness because uh, I see all these tennis players, which to me are like ballet dancers too, is they have a lot of pro issues about mental health and also injuries that by 40 they are almost crippled. Thank you. So how do you keep yourself? Uh, mentally fit, and did you need counseling? Right. Sorry. <laughs> Just gonna hold that up. Thank you, thank you. This is like the question of our time, really, um, and um, it's something that I am still really um, trying to grasp and trying to support my um, students with. Uh, I speak for myself because um, we've just lived through probably the toughest two years of our lifetimes, you know, um, having so much adjustments, so much uncertainties, and it's weighed a lot. And then having to carry the business, making sure that your staff um, aren't let go, making sure that you have enough, um, all of this plays such a toll, and then questioning, um, you know, about what we're doing and is it meaningful? That's that's there as well. So, but I can only speak to myself, and I think mentally, uh, it's always been that belief that you know, we I do what I do because I I love doing it, and I have something to share. I believe when what I'm sharing a hundred percent, and I believe that that's going to make others um, enjoy life better. And so, with that belief, I I move forward, and it. It's given me that strength to, you know, despite how hard it is. It's like when I was a dancer, waking up in pain but still going to train. Well, as as a, a mentor or a leader of an organization, um, believing in what I do has carried me forth. So, I think that's that's where I found my strength. Um, I ha I'm, you know, I think this is very individualized. So people will have to find that strength from whatever works for them. Yeah. Oh, we got a question from Zoom. We've got a question from Zoom. This question comes from Jamie on behalf of her son, Phoenix, who's 16, and he would love to be an international traveling ballet dancer. And his question uh, that she's asked on behalf of him, and I think he'd be thrilled to hear from you directly, is how important it, is it to train with different instructors and travel as a teenager to learn at different ballet schools in the summertime? Oh, that's a great um, specific question to training, and thank you for posing that. I have to advise a lot of my dancers the same thing. Um, where I, from my perspective, you know, since um, this student is, is 16, they're just on the brink of, of discovering and understanding and having that exposure to what is out there. I don't like to recommend um, opening up the training too early because it can be very confusing. I, I do want to advise that um, finding the right foundational training, um, finding a really good teacher from the get-go, one that um, has a can cultivate a relationship um, uh, with the student that they, they it's mutually supportive is key and up until the age of 16 I, th I feel it's important to keep that within the management of one school or one teacher um, or uh, teachers within the same school with the same philosophy once you reach that age of 16 or over you should be set already to know the basics and process things and have that I guess experience and, and intellect to know, okay, this, I've heard this before and it works for me, or mm, I don't know, you know, it's not, it's just, I have had young dancers go to some other dance programs when they're younger and come back injured because they didn't know how to handle some of these directions or come back worse off because they're confused. And it's like, um, so it's like you're working with one recipe Right? You want to continue through until this dish is cooked. You don't want to be like choosing two recipes because you don't really know the outcome. I don't know if I'm, you know, positioning that correct or in, uh, sharing that correctly, but I think her son would be ready to go and experience some of these, but to get some advice from 
the teacher first. A good recommendation. Yeah. Okay, one more question, Ivan, your, your choice. One more question. We've got a few more minutes. Ah, oh, gosh, guys. A lady, I'm going to choose you. Hi, thanks for a great talk. I want, my question is, does your son share your love for dancing, and is he a dancer too? Oh my gosh, thank you for asking. Well, this is, um, I love the question because, um, yes, you know, we, we introduced him to dance, um, and um, I, I have still this beautiful little video of him, and, and he was so talkative and charming, and he was the only little boy in his class. <laughs> but yes, to answer your question, I'm very proud of the fact that even though since age six, he has told me, Mom, I hope you know that I'm not going to be a professional dancer. You know? And I said, that's all right. You don't have to be. But he kept going to his ballet class every Saturday and um, until high school. And then, and then he, he came also during the week. As they get older, they come more than once. Um, he's 16 now. And just in July, he did his Royal Academy of Dance Advanced One exam. And so he, yes, I'm very proud that he dances. Even, yes, thank you. Even though he said to me, I don't want to be a professional ballet dancer. I said, no problem. And then I think at age, hmm, I don't know, 10 or 11, he goes, I hope you know that I'm not going to run go ballet. <laughs> I'm like, what would ever give you that idea, you know? Um, he goes, and then, you know, we, we're driving in the car, and he s says this, and then he goes, um, after like about five minutes of silence, he goes, well, maybe when I'm 50. I said, oh, why? Why do you want to wait till you're 50? He goes, well, you know, I want to do other stuff first. Okay. I said, yeah, no worries. Whatever is, is totally good. I just want you to do your homework. <laughs> So, um, but another fun fact to share, because, you know, um, kids, you know, they just pull at our heartstrings. Um, he is so into K-pop. The Korean music K-pop, he has his own dance team, and they do K-pop performances, and he dances and sings and makes up choreography, and um, he's found his passion there, but he's applying his classical technique. And now I'm a very popular person in his life because he has to come and ask if he can use the Go Ballet studio for his dance team. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, those were such good questions. You have to pick one. Oh my gosh. I mean, well, you, you saw me with my huge smile and joy, and this is personal, but this lady gets the certificate for asking about Avery. <laughs> and, and you would, there's no way you would know this, she's a dancer. Oh. She's a fairly serious dancer. Oh, great. Well, I hope you enjoyed the package. <laughs> Fantastic. Mexicans and they're dancing. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chan on Go.